Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for June 27th through July 3rd, 2022. This is covering 1 Kings chapter 17 through 19. And now, let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Hello, scriptures. Looking great. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 18 minutes, 25 seconds. Whoa, this is a short one. Mm-hmm. Very short. What would it be daily? 2 minutes, 37 seconds. Oh, my goodness. This is like nothing. But, of course, we can't just cover the Come Follow Me reading for this week. There's two much exciting stuff. So because the Come Follow Me reading is so short, make sure to make time for chapters 12 through 22. And if you want to read chapters 12 through 22, and we recommend that you do, it will take you one hour, 16 minutes, 16 seconds, or daily, 10 minutes, 53 seconds. So easy. So set aside 10 minutes a day. You can do it. Yeah, great. Here we've got time codes. If you're interested in just the Come Follow Me chapters, go ahead and click to those time codes. Otherwise, buckle up and we'll talk about them all together. Oh, hey, one more thing. Over the last couple of years, we've had quite a few of you kind enough to reach out inquiring about art prints for some of my paintings used in the show. Those prints are finally available. So if you're interested, check out the link in the video description for the website at 43rdstreet.com and then click on my picture. So as we promised, let's start in 1 Kings chapter 12. And the stuff we're going to cover here is so important to understanding the rest of the history of the Bible. Indeed. Now we're going to be talking about two people with very similar names. One is Rehoboam, the son of King Solomon, and the other is Jeroboam. So let's talk about those two. After Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam became king over all Israel. Jeroboam who we talked about in our last lesson, returned to Israel from Egypt, and along with others, pleaded with Rehoboam to lessen the burdens and taxes Solomon had placed on the people to support his many building projects. Let's pick it up in verse 4. Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore, make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. That seems fair. So Rehoboam says he needs three days to think about it, and he goes to consult two sources. First, the old men, starting in verse 6. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them. Then they will be thy servants forever. Well, that's good advice. Yeah. It almost sounds like the kind of advice you'd hear from, say, King Benjamin in the Book of Mormon. Good point. But Rehoboam decides to listen to the young men that were grown up with him, as it says in verse 8. Here's what ends up happening. So let's pick it up in verse 12. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly, and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him, and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. In other words, you thought your burdens were hard before? I'm going to make it even harder. Why? Because I'm bigger and better than my father. Also, check out the footnote for 11b. He's threatening to chastise them with stinging whips, not actually dumping scorpions on them, although I'm not sure which (laughs) one is any better. So what's the reaction of Jeroboam and the northern people of Israel? Let's pick it up in verse 16. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel! Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed 
unto their tents. Yeah, the Institute Manual summarizes it this way. Those assembled made it clear that they no longer considered themselves to be part of the house of David or Judah. They rebelled against the dominion of Rehoboam and moved to establish their own kingdom. To your tents is an idiom meaning, let's go home. So, in short, the people said, that's it, we're out of (laughs) here. They were no longer going to accept Rehoboam as their king. Right. Now, what happens next always seemed hilarious to me in a dark sort of way. Picture this. You're the king of Israel. You just threatened those whiny other tribesmen that you're going to make their lives even harder than your dad did. They've threatened to secede from the nation. What do you do next? You send the tax collector, of course. <laughs> right. Time to collect your tribute. Let's see how that went over. Picking up in verse 18. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. Poor Adoram. It wasn't your fault that your king was an idiot. (laughs) Speaking of which, the wording in verse 18 would imply that Rehoboam was at least nearby, learned of or witnessed the stoning, and sped as fast as he could back to Jerusalem. That's the smartest thing he's done so far. Oh, man. So the northern ten tribes, that's all the tribes except Judah and Benjamin, rebel against Rehoboam and make Jeroboam their king, which fulfilled the words of the prophet Ahijah. This revolt divided the kingdom in two, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. This division will be helpful to understand when studying later chapters. So Israel is no longer a united kingdom. From this point on, whenever Israel or Ephraim is mentioned, it's likely referring to the northern kingdom. And likewise, whenever Judah is mentioned, we're talking about the southern kingdom. You can see the division of the lands on map three, the division of the 12 tribes in the Bible maps section. You know, it's been a little while since we've attempted to pin a year on these events. The timeline isn't quite stable yet, but it's getting closer. Most scholars agree that the reigns of Rehoboam and Jeroboam were in the 10th century BC. The Institute Manual gives 930 BC, the Bible Chronology and the Study Helps gives 975 BC. This gives us a rough estimate of where we are. We're still almost a thousand years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Yeah, so let's go back to chapter 12, and let's take a look at the northern kingdom. This will cover chapter 12 and 13 and 14, some aspects of that, but let's summarize it here. The seminary manual summarizes it this way. Because the temple was located in Judah, Jeroboam feared that his subjects would travel south to worship the Lord and eventually become sympathetic to the southern kingdom. To prevent this, Jeroboam established new places of worship, idols and feasts in the northern kingdom and appointed his own priests, Jeroboam thus led his people toward apostasy by turning them away from worshiping the Lord at his temple. The Lord sent a prophet from Judah to warn Jeroboam about his wickedness and idolatry. Despite seeing miraculous signs of the Lord's power, Jeroboam did not repent and continued to promote idol worship. Now, an important note This wasn't any old idol worship. 1 Kings 12.28 tells us that Jeroboam made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Does this sound familiar? Do you remember the incident we studied earlier at the foot of Mount Sinai with Aaron and the people of Israel while Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments? Now, before you get too critical and think, really, Israel, did you learn nothing from being forced to drink the powdered golden calf? Remember that the first incident happened at least three centuries ago, maybe as many as five. But ponder for a moment, how important is it to remember? If the people of Israel remembered their history, they would have quickly recognized the problem. Yes, Rehoboam may have been a poor king, But should we put our politics before the true worship of God, even if it's more convenient? You know, there's another aspect of that that I think might have influenced Jeroboam, and that is that if the relationship didn't go well between the two kings, 
Rehoboam could have said, well, I'm just cutting you off. And all of a sudden he's got leverage if he kept the people true to the God of Israel. But the thing is, the Lord promised that if he was righteous, the Lord would build a dynasty with him. And if he had just trusted that and not worried so much about, well, political stuff, it would have been a very different situation. So 1 Kings chapter 14 starts out with Jeroboam worried about his son, Abijah, who was sick. He tells his wife to disguise herself and seek out Ahijah, the prophet, who anointed Jeroboam king, and ask him what will become of his son. Even though Ahijah is old and had evidently lost his sight, the Lord revealed the deception, and he has a message to send back to Jeroboam. Let's take a look at it, starting in verse 7. Go tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Forasmuch as I exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel, and rent the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it thee, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, and who followed me with all his heart, to do that only which was right in mine eyes, but hast done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made the other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger, and hast cast me behind thy back. A quick side note on that phrase, hast cast me behind thy back. The Institute Manual tells us, The expression to cast God behind the back, which only occurs here and in Ezekiel 23.35, denotes the most scornful contempt of God, the strict opposite of keeping God before the eyes and in the heart. Yeah, that's a great clarification. So let's get back to Ahijah's message for Jeroboam in verse 14. Moreover, the Lord shall raise him up a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam that day. But what even now? For the Lord shall smite Israel, as a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall root up Israel out of this good land, which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river, because they have made their groves, provoking the Lord to anger. And he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin and who made Israel to sin. Pay close attention to the prophecy in verse 15. We will see the fulfillment of it later in the year. Mm -hmm. Well, so that's the northern kingdom. I'm sure the southern kingdom is fine. Oh, I hope so. Let's take a look at what they're doing. The seminary manual tells us, After Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam ruled in the southern kingdom of Judah. Look for the spiritual state of the people in Judah. Let's take a look at 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 21. And Rehoboam the son of Solomon reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was forty and one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah, an Ammonitess. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also sodomites, that's male prostitutes, you can see in footnote A, in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. The seminary manual also adds, An especially evil practice of idol worship involving immorality often took place around the groves built to false gods. We've talked about the groves, the Asherah or Asherim. So yes, Jeroboam was encouraging Israel to worship false gods, But so was Rehoboam in Judah. You know, we sometimes wonder why God is removing the people from the land so that the Israelites can come in. But this gives us another clue to that in verse 24. The people that lived in that land rejected the Lord and did abominations, which is why the Lord cast them out of that land in favor of the children of Israel. But now Israel is doing the same thing that those earlier Canaanite nations were doing. Yep. So just like the lessons we learned in the Book of Mormon, you don't get a promised land and then (laughs) rebel against the Lord. You just don't get to keep living there. So how much could have been different 
if these leaders, these kings, would have stayed true to the Lord. Remember the promise to Jeroboam if he kept the commandments as king. This is back in chapter 11, verse 38. It says, And it shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and wilt walk in my ways, and do that is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I will be with thee, and build thee a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee. Now, the idea of the sure house means that just as God will not take away David's dynasty, the lineage of the kings through his line, through Solomon, God would have done the same thing to Jeroboam. Take a look at this chart. I'm going to put a link to this in the description of the video. It's a PDF that shows the history of the Southern Kingdom and the Northern Kingdom at the time that they split. And as you can see here, it gives us who was reigning in the North or in the South Kingdom. But you'll see on the right-hand side here under the Northern Kingdom, we have a list of dynasties. In Jeroboam's dynasty, there's only two people. And then it moves to another family line that takes over usually violently. And we only have two people in that dynasty. There's five dynasties over the history of the northern kingdom of Israel, which means family lines are replaced by other family lines. But God would have given Jeroboam's family line that dynasty. You can see we don't have the same thing happening in the southern kingdom. If you use this chart in your study, know that the descriptions for each of the rulers that you find on the right and left hand side of the chart are taken directly from the Institute Student Manual, Volume 2, from the Enrichment Section A. They do a great job describing and summarizing the reign of each king, as well as giving you the scripture reference, but I thought this might be an easier way to visually see what's happening. And in between the two, you can see an approximate time period where certain prophets may have lived and ministered, either to the Northern Kingdom or the Southern Kingdom. So, I hope that's helpful. Here's an interesting side note. 1 Kings 14.19 mentions that the rest of the Acts of Jeroboam are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. And in verse 29, it mentions that the rest of the Acts of Rehoboam are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. First and Second Kings reference these books a lot. So, do we have either of these books? The short answer is no. The book in the Old Testament called Chronicles, or due to the translation in Greek, it is now First and Second Chronicles, is actually an abridgment of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. So, we don't actually have the full Chronicles of the Kings of Israel or Judah. But it's interesting to see that there were faithful records kept of the Acts of the Kings, both in the Northern and Southern Kingdoms. Perhaps one day we'll discover that the full record was preserved somewhere. That would be awesome. One more bit of trivia. Verse 25 mentions King Shishak of Egypt. Let's read verse 25. And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all, and he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. The Institute Manual adds this, The king of Egypt referred to here as Shishak was most probably the Libyan prince who founded Egypt's 22nd dynasty as the pharaoh Sheshong I. He reigned for 21 years around 945 to 924 B.C., he harbored Jeroboam as a fugitive from Solomon after Ahijah's prophecy of Jeroboam's future kingship. Late in his reign, Shishak invaded Palestine in the fifth year of Rehoboam, 925 BC. He subdued Judah, taking the treasures of Jerusalem as tribute, and also asserted his dominion over Israel, as is evidenced by a broken stele of his from Megiddo. At the temple of Ammon in Thebes, Shishak left a triumphal relief scene, naming many Palestinian towns. Now, an additional point of interest is that this is one of several theories as to what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. It says in verse 26 that Shishak took away the treasures of the house of the Lord. Could that have included the Ark? This is the theory used in the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. 
While this is possible, there's also reason to suspect that two centuries later, Hezekiah, king of Judah, still had the Ark. So who knows? Or maybe it's in a top-secret military warehouse. That is also possible. So in chapters 15 and 16, after the death of Jeroboam, a series of wicked kings reigned in Israel. Again, you can check out the chart. Each of the kings in Israel continued in the ways of Jeroboam by worshiping false gods. However, Asa, Rehoboam's grandson, a king of Judah, was righteous and followed the Lord. There's a more detailed account of his reign in 2 Chronicles chapter 14 through 16. The end of chapter 16 introduces Ahab, king of Israel. Let's take a look at verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. The Institute Manual gives us this commentary. Ahab married Jezebel, daughter of King Ethbaal of Phoenicia, who practiced idolatry of a most depraved kind. Ahab built a house of Baal in the capital city of Samaria and placed an altar to the Phoenician sun god inside it. He then made a grove in which the people could indulge themselves in immoral practices around a symbol dedicated to the fertility goddess Ashtaroth. Four hundred priests who ate at Jezebel's table at state expense assisted her in the extravagant and unholy religion she had brought into Israel. Yeah, let's take a look at verse 33 partway through. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. It's interesting to note that the northern kingdom of Israel over its history, like I said, about 200 years before it's conquered and scattered, never has a righteous king. It certainly has some that are less wicked than others, but that's hardly the same thing. Jeroboam was given a choice by the Lord, and it would have required faith to follow, like we said. But because he chose his own will, his lack of faith led his kingdom down a dark path. And that brings us to our first Come Follow Me chapter, 1 Kings chapter 17. So let's look what can happen when others are given a choice that requires faith, but this time they do it. Let's start with verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand. That's an interesting phrase. Put a pin in that. We'll talk about it later. There shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, we know from Doctrine and Covenants 128, verses 8 through 18, that Elijah held the sealing power of the Melchizedek priesthood, by which things that are bound or loosed on earth are bound or loosed in heaven. As we will explore further in the lesson, Baal was a Canaanite god associated with the weather. Elijah is declaring that it is the god of Israel that rules in the heavens, and that Baal is a false god. Going on in verse 2, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. I would just like to point out that as a bird lover, I think that's a great way to be fed. (laughs) On the flip side, knowing something about ravens, what they choose to eat (laughs) may not be what Elijah wanted to eat. Yeah, that reminds me of what Elder Jeffrey R. Holland told us back in October 2020 General Conference. He says, quote, By my estimation, that can't have been anything we would call a happy meal. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe not, but you know, maybe they upped their game for Elijah. Either way, I think that is pretty cool. So in the coming verses, let's look for examples of faith, starting in verse 8. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now, this land is outside of the kingdom of Israel. 
the New Oxford Annotated Bible says it is a Phoenician territory and the heartland of Baal worship. That area is where Jezebel is from and in the territory where her father now rules. The plague of Baal worship that has infested Israel and brought down this famine originated from there. How strange that the Lord would have commanded this widow from such a place as this to help the prophet. And she's not even an Israelite. And how do we know that she's not? Well, in the New Testament, Luke chapter 24, verses 24 through 26, Christ uses this story to show that Israel didn't honor God's prophet during that famine, but an outsider did. Verse 24, And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, that's Elijah, when the heaven was shut up, three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them, the Israelites, was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto the woman that was a widow. Now it says Sarepta, but our footnotes and other translations show that it was Zarephath. Remember that the New Testament is a translation from Greek, not Hebrew, which can account for the name changes or variations. So even though there were many Israelite widows in need, because the Israelites rejected the prophets, the blessings were given to an outsider who was willing to receive them. Right. So let's take a look. That's the setup. Let's take a look in verse 10 for those examples of faith. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but an handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Okay. We often talk about the widow's faith when we refer to this story, but let's please examine Elijah's faith for a minute. Imagine that you are Elijah and the Lord has told you that he has commanded someone to help you. Perhaps you imagine a humble but well-off widow that helps the community with her resources and so has enough to share with a prophet. Perhaps you also imagine she's expecting you. If, in fact, God commanded her, like he said, that seems like it's news to her. But maybe it's not. Maybe God did command her, but she was like Amulek in the Book of Mormon, when he said, Nevertheless, I did harden my heart, for I was called many times, and I would not hear. Therefore I knew concerning these things, yet I would not know. That's from Alma 10.6. Maybe God had been working with her, and she had resisted him, but he sent his prophet to her, just as he did to Amulek. After all, she said something very surprising for a Phoenician woman in the heart of Baal worship territory to a man, a stranger, she had just met. She said, As the Lord thy God liveth, in verse 12. What does that tell us about what she knows, about who God is, and who Elijah is. So let's look at the faith of Elijah in this instance to ask what he's about to ask, considering her dire circumstances. And let's see the faith of the widow in responding to the call. Picking up in verse 13, And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me. And after, make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruse of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. When does the miracle happen? 
when we go forward in faith. The Red Sea did not part and the Jordan River was not halted until they moved forward in faith. Remember the walls of Jericho or Gideon and his puny army. First, they acted in faith, then the miracle. Elijah acted in faith when he traveled to Zarephath and asked a destitute mother to feed him first. The widow acted against every natural man instinct she had as a mother to be obedient and put the prophet first, trusting in God to open her eyes to understand his purposes. And what amazing blessings, not just for her. What do you suppose and her house meant? It means her household or her family. But why not just say her son? This seems to indicate there was more than just him. Of course she would want to share her blessings with others. I really love how the NIV Study Bible summarizes this story. It says, By an act of faith, the woman received the promised blessing. Israel had forsaken the covenant and followed Baal and Asherah in search of prosperity. Now in the midst of a pagan kingdom, a widow realized that trustful obedience to the word of God is the way that leads to life. That's beautiful. But this does not mean that by learning that lesson, our faith will not continue to be put to the test. True. Let's pick it up in verse 17. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Now, exactly what this sin is is never revealed, but she believes that it is the cause for this tragedy. Going on in verse 19, And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. Now the new Oxford Annotated Bible suggests that the actions Elijah took invoke physical performances where the prophet would transfer some of his life into the child. I wonder if this is for the widow's benefit. Many times God uses physical tools to help focus faith. The Ark of the Covenant and the Brass Serpent, touching or anointing a body part, washing in a river or putting mud over the affected area and so forth. Perhaps these actions by Elijah mean something in the woman's culture that helps her faith. The teller of the story, however, wants to make it very clear that the power of the miracle was the Lord. Going on in verse 22, And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. So in verse 24, it's the first time that she declares this powerful testimony. But she had already experienced miracles. That's true. But sometimes there's something particular or a combination of things that trigger these spiritual monument moments. Like Sariah in the Book of Mormon had doubtless had spiritual experiences, but it was only after the safe return of her sons that we share in her declaration that, quote, now I know of a surety, close quote. That's in 1 Nephi 5.8. So something like that may have been the same for this faithful widow. And that brings us to 1 Kings chapter 18. In the first few verses, Elijah sent a man to tell King Ahab that Elijah was waiting to meet with him. That famine had not humbled the king, and Queen Jezebel had been slaying the prophets, as it mentions in verse 13. The man Elijah sent was named Obadiah. 
There's a short Old Testament book named Obadiah, but most scholars don't believe this is the same person. Admittedly, we don't know for sure, though. Let's pick it up in chapter 18, verse 17. And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? (laughs) And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. I love the reflection of Ahab's maturity. (laughs) Right. I'm being punished for the things I'm doing wrong, and so you are somehow responsible for my pain. Well, what's interesting is that in saying that, he acknowledges that the God of Israel is more powerful than his gods. Right. Now, in the next couple of verses, Elijah invites 850 of the king's false prophets in a competition with just him, one prophet of the true God, the God of Israel versus the false god Baal. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! <laughs> right. Well, this is what it is. It really is this competition between these two voices. Let's find out how it goes. So Israel is gathered at Mount Carmel, and Elijah addresses them. He says, and this is chapter 18, verse 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. This is a good reminder that God's followers are the minority. The world may be arrayed against us, in this case 450 to 1, but we know in whom we have trusted. We will follow him. So here are the contest rules, starting in verse 23. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And so the priests of Baal go first, in verse 25, And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many. And call on the name of your gods and put no fire under. Now, this might be a good time to talk a bit about the pantheon of Canaanite gods. What are we talking about when he said, call on the name of your gods? This information comes from the scholar John A. Svedness. He has an article in the July 1990 Enzyme called Elijah champion of Israel's God. And we're going to quote a chunk of it. There's still much more in the article, and we really recommend it. It gives a great perspective on this world and what we've discovered really only in the last 100 years about the mythology and culture of the Canaanite people. So let's take a look at the article. He says, according to Canaanite mythology, the king of the gods was El, meaning god or strong one. His wife was Asherah, a fertility goddess whose name means grove. The groves, generally of oak or terebinth trees, condemned so frequently in the Bible, were dedicated to her worship. Myths concerning four of the children of El and Asherah are also important to our understanding of the story of Elijah. Baal is a title meaning lord, but also husband. He also bore the name Hadad, thunderer, for he was the weather god, responsible for lightning, thunder, wind, and rain. Anath is sometimes called the virgin, but as the mother of nations, she is often depicted as the wife of her brother Baal. Her name means surface, like surface of the earth. And as such, she received the rains sent down by Baal to produce vegetation. She is therefore a fertility goddess like her mother, Asherah. Considered a very powerful being, Anath was also the goddess of war. Yam, sea, was the god of the waters, on and under the earth. 
many natural phenomena were interpreted in terms of his struggle with Baal for power. For example, sea storms were thought to occur when Yam cast his waves up toward Baal, and Baal would respond by throwing down winds, rain, and lightning, and shouting with his voice of thunder. In the end, of course, the clouds, wind, and rain would disappear, leaving the calm sea the victor. Mat, death, was the god of the underworld, where the spirits of the dead were sent. He was the antithesis of Baal, the god of life-giving processes, and, though brothers, they were enemies. One of the most important Canaanite myths represented in the Ugaritic texts concerns the death of Baal. In the texts, the sky god sponsored a banquet in his palace atop Mount Zaphon. During the banquet, he brought a platter of food and stood before El. The idiom meant that he not only served his father, but that he was also the heir apparent of El. Make note of that for later. During the course of the banquet, messengers arrived from Yam, who, being Baal's sworn enemy, had not been invited. Yam challenged Baal to a duel to the death. Baal left the banquet to meet the challenge and was slain by Yam. Anath brought the tragic news to her father El. The elderly king thereupon left his throne to sit in ashes on the ground, where he began making incisions in his skin with a sharp stone. This Canaanite practice of mourning is frequently cited in the Bible. While sackcloth and ashes were of common use in Israel, the law of Moses forbade making incisions in the skin for the dead. As time went by, the death of Baal proved to be disastrous, for without rain, the earth languished in drought and famine. Something had happened to Baal, but the earth's inhabitants, according to the Ugaritic texts, were uncertain as to whether he was asleep, dead, or off hunting with his lightning spears. While others debated the issue, Anath took action to solve the problem. First, she slew Yam. Then she descended into the underworld to strike a bargain with Mott. The god of the dead, of course, had something to lose in this matter, too. Once all vegetation disappeared from the earth's surface, so, too, would animal and human life, and he would receive no more subjects into his dominion. Anath convinced him that it was in the best interests of all to allow Baal to return to the sky. At length, Mott agreed that Baal could remain in the sky for six months out of the year, providing rain to nourish the earth. During the other six, he would have to return to the underworld while the earth's surface dried from lack of rain. This story was the Canaanite means of explaining the annual vegetation and rain cycles. There had no doubt been many droughts before Elijah's time, but the one recorded in 1 Kings 17 and 18 was especially severe. Elijah announced its coming with these words, quote, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Close quote. All Israel was put on notice that the drought to come would be caused by Jehovah, God of Israel, and not by Baal, the supposed weather god. In making this announcement, Elijah declared his authority to speak for the Lord by adding the words, Before whom I stand, perhaps with deliberate reference to the fact that in the Canaanite beliefs, Baal stood before El. The contest was designed by Elijah to stack the cards in Baal's favor in order to make a greater impression on the people. Elijah designated the summit of Mount Carmel as the site for the encounter. The name Carmel comes from the Hebrew Canaanite Carm El, meaning vineyard of El, and was probably considered by the Canaanites to be sacred to the old Canaanite god, as well as to Baal and to the Canaanites' two chief goddesses. Atop the mount, there still exists today one of the largest forests of oak trees in Israel, these being the symbol of Asherah. As the most prominent piece of land in the area, it was considered part of the body of Anath, the earth goddess. Furthermore, because it is the highest mountain in the region, during thunderstorms it receives more lightning strikes than other points. Probably this was thought to indicate Baal's presence. 
The mountain also receives more rainfall than any other spot in Israel, making it an even more suitable representation of Anath, on whom Baal sends his rain. Elijah asked that two bullocks be provided, one for Baal and another for Jehovah. While sheep and goats were most often sacrificed in Israel, the bullock was the symbol of El, whose full title in the Ugaritic literature is Father Bull El. Again, everything seemed to favor the prophets of Baal. Hmm, really good background. So let's apply that then to the story. Let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 18, starting in verse 26. And they took the bullock, which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us! But there was no voice, nor any that answered. Now, John Tevednes tells us that the Hebrew Canaanite word kol means both voice and thunder. So perhaps they were waiting for some thunder. Back to the verse. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice or thunder, nor any that regarded. Thunder from heaven would have demonstrated that Baal still governs. Let's continue with Tevednes' article. He says, The prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel apparently concluded that their god must have died. Following the traditional Canaanite mourning practice, they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancet till the blood gushed out upon them. Still, there was no thunder, neither voice, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. It was now Elijah's turn. He did several things to illustrate that Jehovah was Israel's only God. First, he rebuilt the altar of Jehovah, which had been torn down, using twelve stones according to the number of tribes of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. Verses 30-32. Next, Elijah dug a trench around the altar and placed wood, probably from the native oak trees, and the bullock atop the altar. He then ordered that twelve barrels of water, again the number of the tribes of Israel, be poured atop the sacrifice, drenching the altar and filling the trench. Verses 32-35 The use of the water, which would inhibit ignition, was another of the steps he took to make the contest more favorable to Baal. Elijah then addressed God in words deliberately chosen to stress the fact that Jehovah was Israel's God, substituting Abraham, Isaac, and Israel for the usual Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Elijah then asked Jehovah to let the people know that Jehovah was the Lord God, verses 36 to 37. The reply from heaven was spectacular. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Verse 38. The appearance of the lightning was but one of several factors that brought the people to bow down and declare that the Lord, Jehovah, he is the God. In verse 39. Jehovah had shown that it was he and not Baal who was able to cast down lightning from heaven, in this case out of a clear blue sky, and that it was he and not the fictitious Baal who had brought three years of famine into the land. But the divine lightning had an even greater significance. It destroyed the bullock, symbol of El, as well as the wood, symbol of El's wife Asherah, thus making Jehovah more powerful than any of the Canaanite deities. The fire also destroyed the water, symbol of Yam, who, as the destroyer of Baal, was more powerful than Baal. More powerful even than Yam, however, was Anath, the goddess of war who had slain Yam. 
Jehovah's lightning bolt consumed not only the stones of the altar, but also the dust, both elements sacred to this earth goddess. There could be no doubt in the minds of those who observed this great miracle, Jehovah was the God. It remained to show that the Lord was more powerful than Mot, the Canaanite god of death, who was able to hold Baal captive for half of each year. Therefore, Elijah ordered that the false prophets of Baal be taken to the Kaishan River, which runs near the base of Mount Carmel, to be slain. Ordinarily, one would be expected to mourn and fast for those who had died, but Elijah clearly instructed King Ahab to eat and drink on the mountain as though celebrating a victory over the enemy. Verse 41. In verse 45, it says, And it came to pass that in the meanwhile, that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. So after three and a half years, it finally rains. And that brings us to 1 Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So Jezebel has made a very clear threat to Elijah that she's going to kill him. In the next few verses, Elijah fled from the land of Israel and traveled many days until he came to Mount Horeb, another name for Mount Sinai. Starting in verse 9, And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth, and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Now, from that same article we've been reading, John A. Tvednis has a really great insight about this scene. Let's pick it up in his article. He says, The Lord had yet another message concerning his true nature to pass on through Elijah. This lesson was to be taught at Mount Horeb in Sinai, where Jehovah had manifested himself in fire and thunder to Israel to reveal his law. We talked about this back in Exodus 19 and 20. Israel had broken his law by turning to Baal. Now the Lord would reveal himself to Elijah in much the same terms as he had done to Moses and all Israel some centuries earlier. Though Jehovah controlled the wind, the earthquake, and the fire, he was none of those phenomena of nature. He was not the wind, as some depicted Baal, nor was he the earth, whose quaking was considered by others to be the movement of Anath, he was not the fire or any other of the elements. Rather, it was the Lord who controlled them all, and he manifested himself, as he does today, in the still, small voice of his Spirit. It is a voice with which we all need to become familiar if we are not to succumb to the strident voices of today's false gods. That's great. There's a quote that we wanted to include from then-elder Henry B. Eyring from April 1991 General Conference. He says, quote, I testify it is a small voice. It whispers, not shouts. And so you must be very quiet inside. That is why you may wisely fast when you want to listen. And that is why you will listen best when you feel, Father, thy will, not mine, be done. You will have a feeling of, I want what you want. Then the still small voice will seem as if it pierces you. More often, it will make your heart burn within you, again softly, but with a burning which will lift and reassure. End quote. 
That is great. And I suspect many of us, if not all of us, have felt that. It's good to be reminded. Now, Elijah was not the only one who was faithful to the Lord. In chapter 19, let's look at verse 16. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Mahaloah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass, that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So wait, is Elisha going to slay people? From the Institute Manual, we get this insight. There is no record of Elisha slaying anyone. This passage may mean that Elisha would prophesy the death of certain people. Of course, the Bible record as it is now is fragmentary at best, and the details of the incident referred to here may be lost. Now, keep an eye out for Elisha. We're going to talk a lot more about him in the next lesson. He is very interesting. He's awesome. I love him. So in verses 19 through 21, Elijah did as the Lord commanded and called Elisha to be a prophet. An interesting side note on the character of Elisha. The Institute Manual says, Elisha must have been wealthy to have been plowing with 12 yokes of oxen, for each yoke pulled a plow and was driven by a servant. The feast of two oxen also indicates wealth. Eating the oxen and burning their equipment symbolically represents Elisha's rejection of worldly wealth as Elisha prepared to follow Elijah and to make the considerable material sacrifice involved in responding to the prophetic call. And that brings us to 1 Kings chapter 20. Here, the Israelites defended themselves in battle against the Syrians. 1 Kings chapter 21 gives us an interesting insight into both Ahab and Jezebel's character. Ahab covets a vineyard owned by a man named Naboth. Ahab offers to buy it, but Naboth can't sell it. As the Institute Manual explains, quote, His land had been inherited from his forefathers, and the law of Moses did not permit the sale of one's inheritance except in cases of extreme destitution. And then it could be sold or mortgaged only until the time of Jubilee, when it would be reclaimed, end quote. So what's Jezebel's solution? Gather a few, quote, sons of Belial, end quote, we talked about those, to claim that Naboth blasphemed God and the king. This is mentioned in verse 10. And the people will stone Naboth until he dies. And they do. Problem solved, right? Everybody wins. Yeah, it's at this point where Elijah prophesied that Ahab and Jezebel would die. His words were fulfilled, and eventually they would both be killed. King Ahab will be killed in this very lesson. Later in 2 Kings chapter 9, it will be Jezebel's turn. But in 1 Kings 22, Ahab joins forces with Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, against Syria. Jehoshaphat is a righteous king and asks Ahab to, quote, inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today, in verse 5. Ahab calls 400 of his prophets, and they all declare victory against Syria. In verse 7, it says, and Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides, that we may inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither Micaiah, the son of Imlah. (laughs) So they bring in Micaiah, and in verse 15, it makes it seem like Micaiah agrees with the advice of the 400 other prophets, but he's being sarcastic. In the Institute Manual, it tells us, quote, It is as though Micaiah said, All your false prophets have predicted success. You want me to do the same? So I will. Go and prosper. This was said scornfully to let King Ahab know that it was contrary to Micaiah's true advice. Hence, the king's response in verse 16, end quote. After the king insisted Micaiah tell the truth, the prophet declared defeat for Ahab at the hands of the Syrians. And in verse 18, 
And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me, but evil? (laughs) Well, I guess he showed him. (laughs) In verse 19 through 23, Micaiah explains that the Lord revealed to him that his other prophets were possessed with a lying spirit. Naturally, this offended the other prophets. So Ahab rejects the declaration of God's prophet and sends Micaiah to prison. In fact, his specific instructions were that Micaiah should remain in prison until Ahab comes in peace. Verse 27. Ominously, Micaiah declares, If thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. Verse 28. Yikes. Even though Ahab had rejected Micaiah's counsel, he thought to play it safe and attended the battle in disguise. Verse 30. That didn't work out for him, though, and he was shot and killed, and the dogs licked up his blood, just as Elijah had prophesied. Hmm. And that's the rest of First Kings. We did it. Wow, what an amazing lesson. It really is. The whole experience with Elijah, there's not a prophet like him. Great, great lessons. I hope that you found some incredible insights, and I hope you understood some of the stories better this time than you have before. John and I sure did. Yep. Next week, we're going to be introducing Elisha and his mission, which is also incredible. So keep reading your scriptures, and we'll talk more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. <laughs>